Up on the bench today is the Radeon 5700 Tai Chi graphics card. This is a really interesting model from ASRock. I think, is this the first time that we've seen a Tai Chi graphics card from ASRock? At least, I mean, they've really captured the Tai Chi aesthetic. The Tai Chi motherboard, I think, has been a very popular motherboard for them. And the Tai Chi motherboard, I think, is you know, everything in balance. At least that's that's their thing, but there's actually something to that because it's like everything you need, nothing you don't. 2040, max boost clock. 2025 on the box, but if you have ample cooling in your case and you can really dissipate a lot of heat, I say 2040, we're gonna put it to the test. In the box you get a Tai Chi door hanger, a Tai Chi coaster. I actually like the coaster. I think they should have included like two or three coasters because it's pretty cool. It's cardboard, it's cheap, it's easy, but I like it. It's a, it's a nice little gear. It's got the gear aesthetic going on. Now this is a good idea. Download a driver utility notice. If the graphics card does not come with the drivers and utilities, please download them from the website. Yes. The, in, the days of like a CD bundled with your crap, this is good. Good job, ASRock. The fit and finish of the card, it's got a plastic shroud with three different size fans. The fans don't look to be modular, but they are screwed in with Phillips screws, so you know, you could do some maintenance. You could take them off and lubricate them without having to disassemble the entire shroud. I am a little bit worried about the, the lack of baffles around the, around the edge of the fan. Basically, the closer the fan blades are to like a duct or a ring, the more static pressure the fans are gonna produce. Remember, you know, the lesson from the, the new Noctua fans where they have like special engineering to prevent the fan uh, from wobbling on its hub so that they can get the fan blades that much closer to the outer ring, which will increase the static pressure of the air. So I, I would expect these fans to have relatively weak static pressure, which might be important for, you know, forcing air through the uh, massive, massive cooler. And it's gonna need it if this thing is gonna run at 2040 megahertz max boost. I mean, truly. It does have a dual eight pin power connector, so you're gonna need a pretty beefy power supply to be able to service this thing. There's also a six display Radeon 5700 XT. So if you're looking for something that's a little bit productivity and a little bit gameplay, but with lots of monitor outputs, cause you know, you know me, I love monitor outputs. Four display port, two HDMI. We used it in our test system here. Our main test system this time around was an NZXT, you know, full tower case. We've got the intake fans. It is a larger card, so you're gonna have trouble fitting this. Even in, you know, medium large uh, cases like the Fractal Meshify C, if you're using a large radiator at the front of the case, you might have trouble fitting this card. So double check those measurements and double check those distances. There's also two switches. There's a BIOS switch, like a BIOS OC switch, so you can toggle between the super overclocked BIOS and the regular BIOS. That's what it comes on by default and you can also turn the leds on and off the middle fan a lot of rgb a lot of fans so if you're going to try to install this thing vertically which generally i don't recommend but if you want to install it vertically to like show it off you know you get the leds if you want or you can just turn them off the cooler here is mammoth i mean this whole thing is metal the back plate is metal it's legit uh, my worry about maybe the fans need a little bit more baffling for directed airflow that doesn't really seem to have been anything. The main curiosity for me was, does this 5700 XT significantly outperform like the base AMD version? Because, well, I mean, it should. The blower cooler, you're paying a premium for the better cooler and the aesthetics and that kind of thing. As we did our benchmarks and our performance, and that kind of thing, I thought sure that I would have to like do something or set something, but no, I was seeing boosts as high as 2031 right out of the box. Now I did enable Wattman and turn things up a little bit from there. And yes, this card gets quite toasty. AMD still has a little bit of work to do on their driver stability. Literally the day before I shot this, there was another adrenaline update and doing a fresh install and a clean install that fixed a lot of issues, but there are still issues that remain. Like the green thing, like where the display would just go completely green. I think that's largely been fixed at this point, but that kept, surfacing so there's also like the obs amf problems although i'm happy to report that if you install obs and you get the you've got the latest version of the amf thing the ui basically works out of the box so if your encoding looks like trash come to the level one forum i'll try to help you i'll try to walk you through the settings that i did but basically it works and so you gotta look at the drivers and a clean install of the drivers but also the other problem that i ran into which is Sometimes the graphics card driver thinks that the CPU is too slow and so it'll wait or down down boost. So I had I had to tune my settings a little bit here. This is testing on a Ryzen 3800X and setting the Ryzen balanced 
profile. I noticed on an Intel system that the frame rate would be worse and it's not because of differences in the platform, it was actually down to power management. And you can really see some of those anomalies in Shadow of the Tomb Raider at 1080p. Because if you look at it and you look at the 1% lows, you can see that our you know, Sapphire Pulse, the lows are kind of low, like 50. Well, digging into that, it's also down to like driver version. So I don't have that card anymore. I had to send it back to Sapphire. I can't retest on the current versions of the driver. So that data is old. But fortunately, I capture a lot more data than just what is shown in the graph. And so I could actually see that the CPU was running slower. You can kind of see that in some of the graphs because it has the graph at the end. But I could actually see that the CPU was running slower in this 50 FPS run than it was in this new run. And it's like, is that down to the ABBA Agiza update or anything like that? Ruled all of that out. That took forever. Basically, the answer is that there was some sort of weird dueling power management thing going on. And so if we look at the true numbers, our 1% lows here is 63 FPS versus 68 and 65. So the 5700 XT, you know, stock right there, 65 with the updated performance and 63 on this. That's basically within margin of error for our 1% lows. And then you can see that the 2070 Super is a little bit better with 68. So the NVIDIA's 1% lows are slightly better, but it's not the dramatic difference between 50 and 68 FPS that it was. Something that probably should be addressed in the video driver, but it's a really odd edge case. And I think maybe now has been addressed in the video driver as of like that update from yesterday. We look at our other games, you know, Shadow of the Tomb Raider at 1440p, which is really the 5700 XT. That's what that's designed for. And this card at 1440p with all of its little overclocking accoutrement, it really delivers a solid performance. Time Spy is probably the best benchmark for looking to see what the differences between these cards really are. And you can see quite the performance uplift on the Time Spy thing. Now, Time Spy is a synthetic benchmark and this number translating into real world performance is dubious at best, but you can see that there is an effect especially over the stock card from AMD in terms of the performance that you can expect from a benchmark like Time Spy. And you can also see it in comparison to the MSI 2070 Super with drivers current as of 10-1-2019. Uh, in terms of overall Firestrike performance, again, on the 3800X test system in the NZXT case with our ASRock Creator X570 motherboard, the story is largely the same. The 2070 Super does eke out a win here, but it's pretty close to margin of error. For Monster Hunter World, there's really nothing out of the ordinary in the results, taking into account what we talked about before with the 1% lows and the overall average. Basically, these cards are neck and neck, the 5700 XT and the 2070 Super. I'll also throw in Ghost Recon Wildlands. Uh, normally, I like to actually like run through and play games even more than really what we show in the video, but it's really hard to control for all of the variables. It takes a lot of time, it's time consuming. Ghost Recon Wildlands is one of those games where I feel like they've really optimized for NVIDIA or they've really you know done things or set them up for NVIDIA. And I was expecting more of a Delta here than I really saw. Now, of course, the 2070 Super comes out on top, but really only by like three to four FPS at most. And in terms of the 1% lows, yeah, the 2070 Super is doing a little better, but not dramatically better. Not as, not as much better as I've seen reported elsewhere, especially around the 1080p and 1440p uh, benchmark. There are a few oddities with this card in terms of performance. Not really oddities. Out of the box, we were seeing boosts over two gigahertz, but then, you know, we did the afterburner thing, like the usual diagnostic stuff that we do, and then we weren't seeing boosts over two gigahertz. Something reset, like something in the driver or afterburner or our configuration, reset the configuration. So I think I think Gamers Nexus did like a uh, an audio controlled study, like where they normalized the noise output to like 40 dB and did their testing that way. And uh, looking at the price comparison of this card, you know, it is $480 on Newegg with a $10 mail-in rebate to $470. I think that if you want that 220 watt TDP, which we were seeing out of the box and was actually a great and painless experience, like you don't have to do any fiddling with overclocking, you can just install it and have a good experience. You don't, you don't have to worry about it. But uh, if you want that experience, it's gonna cost. The best things about this car to remember are the fit and finish, construction, and the outputs. It's unique as far as I know with its display port. I mean, it's got six outputs. So two HDMI, four display port. I would probably be willing to pay the price premium just on that alone, but I'm a multi-monitor freak. So eh, 
If you want to support the AMD ecosystem and have a top performing card, then this is it. But there are other less expensive cards on the market that have similar performance. So it's going to vary a little bit from card to card. Now I think, I think Sapphire here, we, we didn't have the Nitro Plus, we had the Pulse. And I think Sapphire here is a little bit of a disadvantage because, you know, with their drivers, the 1% lows were kind of low. But know that in the testing, like, this is not super scientific, super controlled testing. It's just testing and like, what is your experience? What is it like in a tower machine? What is it like in a tower machine with the side on? And this is a uh, 30, 3800. This is the Ryzen 3800. We tested it with the 3700 and the 3900, but I forget the 3800 is the sweet spot in terms of like heat production, like normal case, eight cores at the highest possible clock speed for gaming, but I digress. You will hear fan noise, especially when the card gets warm and it will get toasty, like north of 90C. It seems to target like 7580C, which I think is a much more healthy minimum. If you don't like those temperatures and you want something that's more akin to stock 570 performance, you can flip the BIOS switch, reboot your machine, and then get more fine-grained control over that if you want to, through like through the, the power tables, through like overclocking. And the card is gonna run, you know, under 70C for, for most things because the, the cooler's pretty beefy. Now in terms of like, VRM contact and you know how hot is the back plate things like that I gotta get an IR camera or something so I can do a little bit better job at this this is really just sort of you know like anecdotal user experience I would really like to do a little bit more analysis a little bit more of a deep dive in terms of this kind of performance to just see you know is this a much better design overall that kind of thing I really just want like I'm gonna take it out of the system I'm gonna take it out of the box I'm gonna plug it in is it loud does it run right do I think it's gonna die soon and is it loud? No. Does it run right? Really well. Surprisingly well. I'm surprised that they're able to maintain above two gigahertz clocks as long as they are. Is it gonna die soon? No, I don't think so because it's able to maintain the temperatures pretty well. The VRM doesn't get super hot. It's a 10 plus one phase design. So I think ASRock has done a reasonable job with this GPU. Is it worth the price premium? It depends on your market. Where I am right now, it's about $100 less than the 2070 Super. So I think a 5700 XT is a better deal than the 2070 Super when it's about $100 less, when we're talking like aftermarket to aftermarket. But it does perform like a really good 5700 XT. So it's nice. Also playing 4K on the Asus XG438Q using Radeon image sharpening is a very nice experience. Rise of the Tomb Raider at like 90-ish, 8590 FPS. That's a nice experience. And, you know, I know I'm not technically playing 4K on Rise of the Tomb Raider, but on, on that monitor, on that setup, it's a lot of fun. I'm Wendell, this is Level 1, I'm signing out, and I'll see you later.